Good afternoon, and welcome to NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. Today, we're going to talk about Northrop Grumman's 12th Commercial Resupply Services mission to the International Space Station. The Cygnus spacecraft is scheduled to launch tomorrow, Saturday, November 2nd at 9.59 a.m. Eastern. It will deliver 8,200 8, pounds of research, crew supplies, and hardware, and there will be, uh, the Cygnus will launch on an Antares rocket from Pad OA from Virginia Space Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. I'm Gina Anderson from NASA's Office of Communications. I'm pleased to have with us today representatives from both the NASA International Space Program, Space Station Program, and Northrop Grumman. First, we'll hear from Mr. Kirk Shireman, manager of the International Space Station Program, Frank DeMauro, vice president and general manager of space systems at Northrop Grumman, Kurt Eberly, and Terry's vice president, Northrop Grumman, Pete Hasbrook, manager of the International Space Station Program Science Office, and Jeff Radish, Reddish, excuse me, Wallops Range and Terry's project manager at Wallops Flight Facility. First, we'll, be, we'll begin with opening comments from our presenters, and then we'll take questions from online using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll also take questions from reporters online if there are any, on the phones, excuse me, if there are any, and of course, reporters and our social media guests here in the room. So with that, should we start with you, Mr. Sharman? Very good, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a great honor to be here um, on a Friday afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Wallops uh, facility for arranging such a beautiful day. And I'm told they're gonna do it again tomorrow, so we're really excited about that. So a wonderful, beautiful fall day here, a great, uh, a great time to launch a rocket into space. There's a lot going on on the International Space Station right now as we sit here in this room and talk, um, approximately one hour ago, we released a spacecraft, the HTV uh, vehicle that was launched out of Tanegashima, Japan, released and it'll be uh, performing a series of maneuvers and, and uh, returning trash uh, back to Earth very shortly. So uh, that just happened over the last few hours. Uh, that was actually released this morning and uh, we're very happy to have that mission completed. It was key to have that mission completed before we could launch this one. So uh, now with the HTV gone, of course, we'll launch tomorrow morning and, and fly uh, 3.9 tons of, uh, 3.7 tons of cargo up to ISS. Really excited about having that cargo up there. So we have the launch uh, tomorrow. Uh, we have the berthing on Monday. Um, we also have uh, on Monday a pad abort test for one of our commercial crew providers. So they'll be doing a pad abort test out at White Sands uh, facility in New Mexico. Uh, another one of our commercial crew providers is doing a hot fire test, a big uh, a key test in their abort, uh, their abort system that will also occur next week. Um, and we'll be having a flight readiness review for another cargo flight uh, next week. So you can just see that things keep going very, very quickly. We just completed um, a spacewalk here uh, a couple of weeks ago. We've completed three of a series of 10 spacewalks. Uh, in fact, that spacewalk was, uh, was uh, very successful. Um, we, uh, we had uh, two of our uh, women astronauts go out and replace a uh, failed battery charge discharge unit that, uh, that was causing us a little difficulty. We paused, because of the failed battery charge discharge unit, we actually paused that series of EVAs. We're going to launch on this vehicle. One of the, some of the cargo that we're flying up today is some equipment that we're required to fly for the Alpha Magneto Spectrometer Repair series of, e, of spacewalks. And so we'll be uh, starting those spacewalks probably as soon as, as uh, the middle of November. So the exact date is not quite certain, but look for it in the middle of November. And we'll have a series of four to five spacewalks to go, uh, to go repair the Alpha Magneto Spectrometer. And as soon as we finish those spacewalks, we'll, uh, we expect to get back into the battery uh, spacewalks and finish up those, uh, those spacewalks. So um, uh, really, really busy time on the International Space Station. We'll finish off the year. We're expecting to fly the, for the uh, first um, uh, orbital flight test of the Boeing uh, Starliner on, uh, on December 17th. Um, so uh, really no rest at all for the re remainder of this year. We're here today to talk about uh, Antares and Cygnus. 
Um, this is a great capability. Um, this flight is actually the first of our cargo resupply two contracts. So we had a cargo resupply one contract and, uh, and um, the last flight, NG-11, uh, NG was the last flight from, uh, from uh, Northrop Grumman on that contract. This will be the first flight on this contract. And it's not just a contract boundary, actually significant uh, increased capabilities of these vehicles. So uh, I'll let Frank uh, give you some of the details, but suffice to say, we've really opened up the aperture, opened up the capabilities to fly science on these flights. And so this vehicle will be carrying a tremendous amount of, uh, of science, even a very late load. In fact, as Frank and I were talking just before this press conference, uh, his crews were out there loading, uh, loading the remaining uh, science on board the rocket that's going to fly here in, in less than 24 hours. So really, really uh, uh, important capabilities. Um, on board here on, the, on this flight, in terms of science, there's, uh, we have the capability to, we're, we're looking at things that will help fly humans um, deeper into space, certainly to put humans on the moon. Um, so we're going to test some equipment that's up there that would be really important for keeping humans alive in space for long duration. We're flying um, things for National Lab. We're actually flying a number of payloads for education. Um, we're flying some CubeSats that were made by uh, a university here in the U.S., uh, University of Washington. Um, and we're also flying a Genes in Space payload, which was actually a payload developed by a high school student. Um, and a really, really uh, important education payload, so just fascinating. Uh, of also note is uh, we have uh, actually tomorrow, after, tomorrow after we launch, we'll have two Cygnus vehicles flying in space. And I believe that's the first time we've ever done that. So really excited about uh, having uh, NG-12 up there uh, while NG-11 is still up there uh, conducting uh, important research for us. So great, great capabilities. Um, like I said, over 3.6 tons of uh, cargo going up, 1.9 tons of utilization. And uh, we're really excited to have it on board and, uh, and uh, conduct that research together with all the spacewalks we'll be doing. Thanks very much. All right, well, good afternoon. And uh, on behalf of Northrop Grumman, let me also welcome everyone to uh, Wallops Island, Virginia. Tomorrow's NG-12 launch will be our 12th mission to resupply the International Space Station, uh, and it will also be our first mission under the, the CRS-2 contract. Uh, right now, all systems are go for launch. Liftoff is scheduled for 9.59 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, we are set to deliver about 8,200 pounds of uh, supplies and scientific experiments to the space station. That's the largest amount of cargo that Cygnus and Antares have delivered to the ISS, and that's one of the many upgrades that we've added to the system. Uh, to support this mission. I'll talk about a few more of those in just a minute. Um, but before we go into greater detail about the mission, uh, we'd like to share with you a video uh, that highlights the journey that Antares and Cygnus make as we count down towards uh, launch. Let's go to that video.
gets old, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, both Kurt and I are extremely proud of, of our teams uh, and the broader team that has gotten us to this point. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work that goes into each of these missions. They're each special and unique. Uh, the team focuses on it as though it's the first time we do it to make sure that it's safe and, and successful. And so we'd, we'd like to thank the Wallops team, Virginia Space, of course, our NASA customer, as well as the Antares and Cygnus teams and all the folks that play such a role in, um, in uh, putting these missions on, conducting them successfully, and really our goal of, of delivering for our customers. So I do want to talk a little bit about the upgrades that we've made to the Cygnus spacecraft as part of the CRS-2 contract. Our focus in response to NASA's needs is to make Cygnus as science-friendly uh, as possible. And so uh, a bunch of the things that we have done are really in that, uh, in that vein. So uh, the first thing is uh, one of the things that uh, we have in the spacecraft or something we call the mid-deck locker, and those are the places where we put a lot of the science payloads that we carry to the ISS. And up until our Northrop Grumman 11 mission, we were able to carry up to six total, with four of them powered. And now, starting on CRS-2, we can fly up to 10 mid-deck lockers with up to six of them um, powered. Uh, to support those powered payloads, we've implemented some systems where the scientists can actually converse with those payloads while the vehicle is being processed through launch and all the way on the way up to the space station before we only had the c capability of talking to the experiments right before they were loaded and then once they were pulled off the, uh, the Cygnus spacecraft. So we have people at the Marshall Space Flight Center who are monitoring the experiments, actually seeing data from the, from the payload uh, as we speak. Um, Kurt alluded to the fact that we do do our final cargo load at uh, 24 hours before, before launch. We did that on Northrop Grumman 11, and that's really critical because we want to get minimize the time it takes from when they deliver the time-sensitive payloads to us to the time that we deliver it to the ISS. And the system that was developed between the Antares team and the Cygnus team and the Wallops team uh, really lets us do that. And so that's a, that's a nice capability that we're able to add. But on this mission, it's the first time they're actually processing those payloads in the, the local area as opposed to doing it from Florida. And so we have uh, we have a teaming with uh, the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk. Uh, we also have scientific labs here on Wallops. And so all the live science gets readied at the EVMS in Norfolk and gets uh, shipped up here. And then we have the science labs right here on Wallops to support the scientists. So that's a new capability. Uh, the other thing we've done is we've tried to give NASA as much flexibility as we can in how much cargo they can load in that final load. And so. Uh, before it was a much lower number, now we can provide up to 20% of the total cargo load can actually be loaded at that L-24 period. That, that's about 1,650 pounds of cargo, so it's a good amount of cargo that NASA can load right at the end. Uh, the other thing, as Kirk alluded to, is for the first time we're actually going to be operating two Cygnus spacecraft in orbit at the same time. We launched NG-11 in April. Uh, that has been a very successful mission. It departed the station in July after 106 days. Uh, on the ISS. That's the longest time we've spent on the ISS. And after that time, we started a long-duration free-flying demonstration mission, and that has continued extremely successfully. And so that is orbiting. The, the, our team in Dulles is monitoring both vehicles as we speak. And then once NG-12 gets into orbit, we'll actually have two Cygnus vehicles in orbit. And we think that's a, a key capability for NASA or for other government agencies or commercial industries. If they want to fly uh, uh, some sort of a rideshare payload or some sort of an experiment, being free-flying and outside of the ISS, uh, we actually can provide a pristine microgravity environment for those experiments. So we think that'll be a useful capability for the future. Uh, and the other thing we've added this time is instead of just carrying disposal cargo, which is a critical capability, uh, on the inside of the cargo module, now NASA can attach on the outside of Cygnus uh, external disposal cargo that we'll take with us and re-enter um, as, as we burn up. So, so all of these things are really meant towards being as science-friendly as possible to NASA and providing them as much flexibility uh, as we can. So we're excited to demonstrate those on this mission. Um, we will separate tomorrow um, about 10 minutes after liftoff, and then Cygnus will begin about a 40-hour journey on this, in this case. Uh, on its way up to the ISS, we'll do both raising the orbit up to the ISS orbit, which is roughly 400 kilometers, and we'll also phase where we are in that orbit so that we get to the ISS um, uh, at sometime early morning hours on, on Monday. We expect to be grappled by the crew at about 4.10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on <laughs> Monday, to catch that. 
Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to that and the team's, uh, the team's ready for that. And then lastly, uh, you know, it's a tradition at Northrop Grumman that we name these missions uh, after, after people who've meant uh, really something special to uh, the space community. Uh, in this case, we are honoring it after uh, astronaut Alan Bean. Um, Alan Bean flew on Apollo 12. He was the fourth person to walk on the moon, and that was 50 years ago. And so 50 years later, we're ready to launch NG-12 and Cygnus in his honor as we journey to the International Space Station. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kurt. Thanks, Frank. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Antares team, we are really excited to be back here at Wallops with our NASA and Virginia Space Partners for another Antares launch. First, I'd like to uh, give a big thank you to Dale Nash and the rest of the Virginia Space Team who operate and maintain Launchpad Zero A for us. They do an outstanding job, and we appreciate the excellent support from the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'd also like to thank Jeff Reddish, who's just to my left, uh, and the Rolfs Range Team for the partnership with us on preparing, uh, preparing for and launching these missions. In addition, I'd like to thank the FAA, who licenses our launches, and the folks who travel here to support our activities and work closely with our team to perform their oversight role. We also get great support from the local community here, so thanks to you as well. Turning, turning now to ancient history for a moment, we had a very successful NG-11 mission this past April 17th, and I hope many of you were able to be here to see it. That was the last launch on the Cirrus-1 contract, as Frank has said, and the fifth launch of the 230 configuration of Antares. All five of the Antares 230 configuration launches delivered Cygnus to, the, to, the, to orbit right on the money with very repeatable performance from both of the stages. The NG-12 mission will feature an upgraded Antares configuration called 230 Plus that has increased capabilities to meet NASA's CRS-2 mission. I'd like to outline those increased capabilities for you next. First, the CRS-2 mission requires more mass to orbit, both because we are carrying more cargo, as Frank mentioned, to the ISS, but also because Cygnus itself will be heavier in order to provide all those great services that NASA, to NASA that are required for CRS-2 that Frank just described. So we've increased the mass to orbit capability of Antares in three main, with enhancements in three main areas that I'll just run through here for you. First, we added more structural capability to the first stage core, which allows us to keep the main engines throttled at 100% for most of the first stage burn, and eliminate the throttle notch we have been flying through the region of maximum dynamic pressure. We made, second thing is we made most stages lighter by implementing uh, a series of optimizations on each stage. And finally, we consolidated the upper stack composite structures to be lighter weight overall. All of these vehicle enhancements, plus lowering the perigee of our target orbit slightly, have allowed us to increase our mass to orbit on the order of 800 kilograms or 1,760 pounds. The second CRS-2 capability addressed by the 230 plus configuration is final cargo load at L minus 24 hours. Uh, from an Antares perspective, to do this, we modified the payload fairing to feature a removable pop top nose cone that was shown in the video that you saw. And we developed a mobile clean room that was the shot inside that, that showed the cargo load that goes over the front of Antares to provide a controlled environment for that final cargo load. And there it is. We also changed how we interface the vehicle to the launch mount so that we can more rapidly rotate from horizontal to vertical and then back again. Uh, you may recall that we were able to cut in these changes early on the NG-11 missions and demonstrate those and, they, and everything went very smoothly on NG-11. Uh, the final CRS-2 capability I'll address is cargo mass flexibility. This mass flexibility allows NASA the, the ability to alter the final cargo load by 20% of the total cargo mass right up to that final load at all minus 24 hours. So in case something goes wrong or they need to take something off the manifest, they can do that right up to the 24-hour final load. So on the Antares side to do this, we've modified our Antares 230 Plus guidance software to allow the final Cygnus mass, which includes the final NASA cargo mass to be uploaded to the flight computer by our vehicle operator on the day of launch. The guidance software then adjusts the vehicle trajectory to fly to the correct orbit. Next, I'll talk about the status of our preparations for the NG-12 mission. On Tuesday, we rolled out to the launch pad, connected up to the, to the launch pad, and rotated the rocket to vertical. Wednesday morning, we completed the combined systems test, which verifies all connectivity between the Antares rocket, the Cygnus spacecraft, the launch pad, and the range. This went smoothly, and Wednesday evening, we rotated the vehicle back to horizontal, which you saw in the video, in preparation for the final cargo load, which took place this morning and is now complete. This afternoon, we will close up the Cygnus hatch, then the Antares fairing, 
roll the mobile clean room out of the way, and Antares will be rotated back to vertical at around 9 p.m. this evening to prepare for launch tomorrow. The Antares and Cygnus teams will arrive on console at 4.30 a.m., and the five-hour countdown will begin at 5 a.m. The five-minute launch window opens at 9.59 and 46 seconds, Eastern Daylight Time, and we will target the opening of the window. <laughs> Fueling of the liquid first stage will occur one and a half hours prior to launch. We ignite the engines at, at L0 to an intermediate throttle setting and do an automated health check about two seconds after L0 to ensure both engines are up and operating. After the health check is passed, the Antares flight computer will throttle up the main engines, release the hold down clamps at the base of Antares, and pull back the transporter erector launcher, which serves as our umbilical mast out at the pad. The first stage will burn for approximately 200 seconds before main engine cutoff. That's a little earlier than the 230 because we're staying at 100% throttle. The vehicle will then coast for approximately 50 seconds, during which time the flight computer will separate the first stage, the payload fairing, and the inner stage. Stage two will then be ignited and burn for approximately two and a half minutes. After burnout, there's a two minute settling period and we separate Cygnus and deliver them to orbit. It's been a smooth integration flow so far and all systems are go on Antares at this time. Thank you for being here, and we're looking forward to a good launch tomorrow morning. Okay. Well, thank you, Kurt. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to everybody who's watching on NASA TV. Um, I hope you are as well. I am really excited to be here and be able to talk about the science. Um, if you were here this morning, you were able to see a really good What's On Board briefing that talks in more detail about the science. And personally, it was a real highlight for me. I got to introduce a Nobel laureate uh, Professor Samuel Ting, who's the PI, Principal Investigator for the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. Not every day you get to announce a Nobel Laureate to an audience, and that is a great thing, a representative of the type of science that we can do on ISS. I um, appreciate hearing all the upgrades on the Cygnus vehicle. Um, the vehicle is just so important, and these modifications are helping our science in so many ways. The ability to load science later after we've identified it in our cargo manifesting flow, to replace something at the last minute, maybe more important is all the powered locations where we can keep our, our life sciences powered from launch through the arrival at station. There's a lot of things that happen in microgravity that are very quick, and to be able to keep our specimens powered and going and monitor them through that flight, that's really important to us. The Cygnus is bringing research cargo that supports, by my count, over 30 different investigations on the ISS. About 20-ish of those are going to be new investigations starting after the Cygnus arrival. Another 10 or 15 or so are already ongoing on the ISS and are resupplied. Um, I'd like to go to a video here, some of the highlights of the science that's launching on the ISS.
actually have an update to that video. Even though that video was made really recently, you saw an experiment on there for Budweiser growing barley in space. They decided they needed a little bit more time to finish their, their documentation and prepare the payloads, so they asked to move to the next flight after this one. That is perfectly fine with us. That actually demonstrates the kind of capabilities we talked about with the Cygnus. We want to fly experiments when the experiment and the, the providers say they're ready. We don't want to rush them. But that said, if somebody can be ready and come up and, and get ready to launch with us, we want to take you with us. Now, Kurt talked a little bit of ancient history, and he went all the way back to April of this year. I'm going to talk maybe some more ancient, ancient history. Tomorrow marks the beginning of our 20th year of having humans in space. It's the 19th anniversary of the launch of the Expedition 1 crew and their arrival at the ISS back on November 2nd of 2000. And if you think back of that, what that means is that if you look around the world, over a quarter of the population of the world have been born since we've been flying humans in space. They know nothing else other than humans living and working in space. And that's really cool for us, and you'll hear a lot more about that over the coming year. And in fact, I think we have a graphic. We announced this yesterday because it was a Friday and it was a great news day. Um, we have the logo of the ISS 20th anniversary, and I appreciate Kirk leaving me some thunder to talk about here. <laughs> Um, you'll see a lot more of this logo on our products through the coming year, and especially in the science world, we are going to look back over the 19 years and look at some of the highlights that we have, not just of experiments, but of results. Results from our scientific research are really important. A little extra bit of history here. Over the course of our almost 19 years, through this past March, we have done more than 2,700 different experiments on the ISS, and that's across our five agency partnership. We've served over 4,000 scientists as principal investigators or co-investigators. We've, uh, we've had 108 countries participate either in traditional research or in educational activities. We know of more than 1,700 research peer-reviewed publications to talk about the results of the work that's been done on ISS. Very important that we able to build up that knowledge and especially establish and, and track the results of the work we do so we can share that. But we also look forward at NASA, in NASA and on the ISS, and we look forward to going to the moon. I know you know about the Artemis program, and we're looking forward to landing the, the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. Well, the ISS has been helping us toward those goals for all of the years that we've been working. We strive to, to understand the human response to space flight and living in space, and do human research to make our crews safe and healthy. And some of the areas that we work in are bone and muscle loss and vision, how space affects vision, health monitoring, re monitoring people medically, remotely, uh, physical and mental function in, in that enclosed environment. But we also demonstrate and test technology, demonstrating advanced life support systems, um, trash disposal, logistics, and even fire safety on board ISS. Not just human research and technology, though, but the ISS is a model for how we want to go to the moon, how we want to go on to Mars. We are an international partnership of five agencies, 15 countries, many more who participate through these activities. That is a model that we offer to the Gateway Program, the international model, and to landing on the moon with, with humans and further exploration beyond that. And not, uh, it, we are in essentially an international treaty, and so that's a, a government's model. It's uh, an operations model for working together with people around the world. Some of the products, just to wrap this up, that you can follow along with us, we write stories that we put on nasa.gov, www.nasa.gov slash iss-science. You can follow us on IS under, iss underscore research. And we also have an app for that. We have the Space Station Research Explorer app for your iPhone or your Android device. You can find those in the stores. It's SSRX, Space Station Research Explorer. It's got all the data about the experiments that we do and the ones that are coming up, both at a high level for the, the person who doesn't understand so much science, and then at a deeper level for somebody who may understand that field of science. So again, we're excited to be here. Thank you all for coming, and we're looking forward to a great launch of science tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to second what Frank said. This never gets uh, trivial. I, the range is super excited to uh, launch the Antares. This is uh, the 10th mission out of Wallops, and uh, it never gets old. It's always very exciting to be able to, to launch this big rocket out of Wallops. So we appreciate the opportunity to do that, usually about two times a year. You know, we do it in the fall and the spring here. 
for the most part, and, and every time it's always exciting and fun to be a part of this team. Um, the range is ready, it's green. We've done all our testing, all tracking, telemetry, and command assets have been tested successfully. Um, we've had the final data flow this morning. It was very successful, so we've, we've locked up configuration, we've put no digs in place, uh, we've uh, submitted and, and, and have verification that all range clearances have been um, established with the FAA and Bay Capes. So we've, uh, we're ready, we're ready to go with that. Um, as well, um, the people that I work with day in and day out are, are all excited and look forward to this every, every, every time we get to do this. So um, without further ado on the range, let's go to the weather. I'm, uh, I think everybody's very interested in the weather, so we'll put your weather slide up for me, please. So if you look at the weather for tomorrow, we have a probability of violation of 5%. That's how our weather guys give us. I'm going to roll that into a positive that 95% chance tomorrow that we're going to launch this rocket. So uh, we're very excited about that. The weather's perfect. Uh, the eastern shore is a perfect place to launch a rocket. So uh, what can get better? Great weather in the eastern shore launching a rocket out of Wallops. So that's, that's what we look forward to. Um, the backup day is, is it will be uh, Sunday. Sunday it's a little bit less, but 90% chance of being able to get this rocket out of here on Sunday if for some reason we have to slip out of Saturday. So uh, all very good weather days in front of us. Uh, Sunday looks a little bit more breezy, so that's why the uh, uh, opportunity is a little bit less, but still very high on, on the charts for us getting that thing out of here. And then come Monday we have a recycle day, so uh, on day three actually is, is the backup day for, uh, for the third launch attempt. That'll be uh, Tuesday. And uh, a little bit breezy, and if you read this chart a little, a little closer, it says disturbed weather. So I went to our weatherman, I said, what does disturbed weather mean? And they said, it'll probably rain. I'm thinking, okay, well, okay, there is a chance of rain on, uh, on Monday, so, uh, or, or Tuesday, I'm sorry, that uh, could potentially have some violations, but, but still very high, 70% uh, chance of getting this thing out of here on uh, Tuesday if, if we have to slip to that day. And again, we have backup days throughout. Um, the, the uh, month of November, so uh, if, if we can't get it out of here then, we've got, got multiple days in place to uh, be able to get to. So the, the range is ready, we have everything in place, and we look forward to getting this thing out of here. Thank you. Thank you for those great summaries. We're now ready for, for questions to our guests. Uh, we'll take questions in the room. Please raise your hand and uh, wait for a microphone. Also state your name and affiliation. We um, also are taking questions from social media. Make sure you send uh, your questions into hashtag AskNASA. So with that, we'll get started. Hi, Michael Baylor for NASASpaceflight.com. I was wondering either for Kurt or Frank, you've had a lot of incremental upgrades to the Cygnus and Antares throughout the course of CRS-1 and now onto CRS-2. Do you plan any more upgrades throughout CRS-2? And if so, what will those be? Thank you. Well, on the, on the Cygnus side, our, you're, you're right. I mean, from the time we delivered the first vehicles to the ISS, they were primarily cargo delivery vehicles and disposal vehicles. And over time, we've added more and more capabilities in the spacecraft to be more and more science friendly, to uh, add the ability to have more plug and play payloads. We've added more cargo capability. And so that was an exciting part of CRS-1. CRS-2, I would describe as more of a step function change in, in the capability. Our current plan is to keep the capabilities we currently have throughout the first part of CRS-2. Uh, however, as we go through these missions and if, if NASA identifies additional needs that they have, or if we identify good ideas where we can, we can increase those capabilities, we would work those with NASA and potentially add, uh, add more upgrades. So we'll, uh, we'll be responsive to what, uh, what our customer needs, and we think we've got the building blocks within the vehicle to do some of those things. And if I could add to that, we, Frank and I, every time we see each other, we talk about, hey, could you guys do that? Or, or Frank will come, Kirk, what do you guys think about this? So I, I can tell you that, one, as our requirements evolve, we're looking at that, and we're lo always looking to make things better, whether it's more capability to launch or get it to ISS quicker uh, or to bring things home. So uh, all, all those things are, uh, are on the table. We're always discussing them as our requirements in, in, in emerge. And, uh, and Frank and the Northrop Grumman team have been fantastic in, in working with us, and I suspect that we'll continue to have this great relationship going forward. Okay, I think she's next. Thank you. 
Hi, Chelsea Goad with Space.com. Um, I have kind of a two quick questions. Um, just to clarify, um, it, it showed in the video before that this new configuration of the Antares, the 230 plus, is the most powerful version of the rocket so far. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. Um, and then the, the meat of my question is regarding the double Cygnus spacecrafts um, in orbit around Earth, which is very exciting. Um, do you foresee any issues with there being two in orbit at the same time? And do you foresee there ever being three or even mm -hmm. more in orbit at the same time? We'll launch as many Cygnus vehicles as NASA would like us to uh, <laughs> launch. <laughs> Uh, I think the, uh, we don't foresee any issues. We've done a lot of uh, testing. This, this capability was something we implemented a few missions ago, targeting that the NG-11 would be the long duration free flyer. And part of that experiment was to show our ability to fly uh, what's called a control moment gyro. Uh, Cygnus actually uses fuel to control itself uh, under m normal circumstances, but the control moment gyro allows the attitude control to be done by uh, wheels within that system, and so we don't use a lot of fuel. In fact, over the last three months we've been flying with it, we've shown minimal fuel usage to keep the vehicle in the proper attitude. So that was, that was one of the big things. And then the other thing we wanted to do was, uh, was do this dual Cygnus in orbit demonstration. Uh, it is a demonstration, so it's, it's an experiment. It's something we have simulated, we have tested on the ground. We've actually been able to monitor both NG-11 in orbit and NG-12 on the pad at the same time, and that's enabled our team to practice a little bit of being at their terminal in our control center in Dulles, switching between displays between NG-11 and NG-12. Uh, we've worked through simulations, so we've, we've implemented some systems so that the, the, the team can clearly see which vehicle they're looking at, and also we have to be careful about which vehicle we're commanding, so we, we've done some tests and check out and, and forced some anomalies to make sure the team can under, make sure if we're going to send the command to 11 that it gets to 11 and not 12. So uh, we don't anticipate any issues, but like I said, it's an experiment. We'll learn things from it, and we'll be able to implement those lessons learned on uh, missions going forward. Okay, next question. So Twitter user Philip asks, are there any scheduled Cygnus missions on an Atlas V? Uh, no. All of our uh, missions, we have six missions on CRS-2 so far, and they're all Antares out of Wallace. Okay. I think you're next. Jeff on Space News. Uh, two quick questions for Frank. How long will NG-11 Cygnus stay in orbit, and what are you doing with that? And then for Kurt, with the expanded Antares capability, are you seeing new interest from customers other than the CRS program? I guess on the first one, uh, we, our current plan is to, to get NG-12 on orbit. We have the majority of our team focused on a successful mission and getting on the ISS. Uh, the, the approach we've taken is once we're safely on the ISS and we know we've delivered our cargo for our customer, then we will begin the process of deciding when to end the NG-11 mission. The team is always thinking of uh, potential things they might want to check out with the vehicle, and so we'll entertain those since we have the opportunity. So we haven't set a deadline when we'll bring it back. I don't expect it to be uh, that much after we get NG-12 on orbit, but um, we'll, we'll tackle that, uh, that question after we get there. Okay. Next question. And, and for Antares, uh, yeah, the 230 plus uh, capability, um, we, we are on ramp to NLS2. That's, a, that's how NASA buys uh, science missions. And so we have, at, we have updated the performance tables that are on that contract and uh, submitted all that to NASA for, uh, for, for future science mission bids. That allows us to be more competitive and lift heavier payloads and address more market uh, uh, you know, going forward, and we'll continue to do that. Okay. In the front here. Sarah Plumatalo from Kelby Elementary, part of NASA Social. Um, my students wanted to know, um, for any resupply mission, what aspect of mission preparation is most susceptible to delay? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, <laughs> the answer of any probably answer, isn't acceptable. You should answer that after we launch. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, weather is always a big, always a big part um, that we, we keep our eye on. Jeff talked about how uh, nice it is that tomorrow we have 95% chance of good weather for launching. A any part of the process, the, our focus is mission success and safety. And so at any part in the process, if we identify something that doesn't look right, whether it's on the spacecraft, whether it's with the cargo, 
whether it's with the processing of the of the vehicle uh, we will we will take a pause uh, check it out if something has to be fixed we'll fix it if it's just some sort of an adjustment we'll do that so there's so many parts of this um, process that at any point something can come up and and cause a delay I think it's we, we've taken pride in the fact that we've we've been able to to deliver uh, nearly on time on all the missions so far uh, but at any like I said every mission is unique and so we'll just continue to focus on mission success and if delays occur because that's what's necessary for a successful mission then then we'll do that yeah I would like to uh, I have a son who's an elementary school student and so I would I would offer to your students to not wait until the last minute to do things uh, that would be my sincere advice um, on this mission we rolled out early and uh, we spent most of yesterday resting so that was a great feeling so because of this new late load capability, actually what it does is before, before we had the late load capability in the pop top fairing, we had to load all the cargo back in the HIF, the horizontal integration facility, and we had to rush, get out to the launch pad, go vertical and launch as quickly as we could to preserve the science timelines that, uh, that Pete talked about. Now we can go out early without that final load, take our time, go vertical, hook everything up, run our combined systems test with the range, make sure everything's working, go back down horizontal and take a day off if everything's going well. If not, we fix those things and we have some time in the schedule. So, so we've put in margin days uh, where we think it's judicious uh, in coordination with Cygnus, and that's, I think, allowed us to target this launch date with some, with, I'd say, more comfort than in past. Uh, and I just note that the NG-11 mission uh, launched right on the originally contracted date of April 17th. And I was told by NASA, actually, that that's the only CRS mission out of 25 launched at that point to have launched on the originally contracted date that never changed by, by either party. So uh, I think we're getting, we're getting better at this. And, and it's all about trying to control everything you can and, and look out for problems and anticipate problems and have a backup plan for as much things as you, as you possibly can. <laughs> as an do your example, homework now. Uh, okay. Great as an example of uh, of what Kurt said not to do, one of the other things could be could be a problem on the ISS, uh, and so things like not getting rid of the vehicle that's on the port that you're coming to would be an example. So here we are at 12, almost one o'clock this afternoon. We released the the uh, HTV, so it was you know whatever that is, 22 hours before the launch. There's also a number of equipment that has to work on board ISS. Any of those things could, uh, could cause a delay. Uh, now that we've mentioned them all, hopefully none of them will occur. <laughs> I have a social media question? Yeah, I have two if that's OK. Um, so Twitter user Peter wants to know, how does the upgraded Antares 230 plus deal with maximum dynamic pressure zones? That's a great question. So uh, because we're keeping the throttle at 100%, the loads are higher. So we've beefed up the first stage structure in two places, the inner tank bay between the kerosene tank aft and the liquid oxygen tank forward, and then also the forward bay, forward of the liquid oxygen tank. So we've added some more metal to those shells, and that's actually given us better bending capability and structural capability so we can fly through higher loads that are created when we go faster through uh, max Q or maximum dynamic pressure uh, region. Uh, we've also implemented what's called a load relief autopilot. So our autopilot actually steers a little bit into the wind and is not so rigid about meeting the exact uh, profile that we've planned until we get through the thickest part of the atmosphere. Then we'll steer back and uh, steer back on track and, uh, and meet the, uh, the orbit target requirements that are important for Cygnus so that they can rendezvous most efficiently with the space station and use the amount of fuel that we've budgeted uh, for Cygnus. And then this last one could go to anybody. Uh, from Twitter, which project are you most excited about in terms of potential success? For example, would success with the oven and microgravity lead to other substantial progress? Boy, what a good question, hard question too. I think, uh, I'm gonna go a different way. I think uh, Professor Grittoni's experiment where he's using uh, carbon composite materials that are intended for medical implants but he's exposing them on the outside of the station because it's a very harsh environment. And we were kind of quizzing each other recently of how could that harsh environment affect you to learn about something that's an implant? Well, it's really about testing and, and hoping to learn something that you weren't expecting and going somewhere where you don't know what's gonna happen. But sometimes in that different environment, it's like going to microgravity. You see something that you totally di didn't expect and it allows you some insight into what's really going on at the very small level. Okay. Ken. Mary Liz Bender with Cosmic Perspective. 
So earlier today, we learned about some really great science experiments that are going up on this uh, payload. But Kirk, you mentioned a high school student's experiment that excited you. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can tell you for sure that high school students smarter than I am. Uh, every year, uh, we have an ISS research and development conference. Um, we have people from, I was going to say around the country, really around the world who attend talk about the science that they're doing on, they've already done on ISS, they talk about the science they're doing on ISS and what might be coming. And, uh, and there's a group, Boeing uh, and, and a, a, another couple of organizations have this competition called Genes in Space. And they have high school students, or really groups of high school students uh, from around the country, around the world, who come and brief their experiment and what they hope to learn. Um, and so uh, I actually, I make a point of going into that session every year and, uh, and listening to the students, and I am floored. We have a, a wonderful future ahead of us, I can tell you that for certain. Now, if you ask about the specific one, uh, we can have some information on it. Uh, this case, it's a DNA experiment, and, and I have a little bit of information, but I would just be reading what I have. So maybe the best thing is, unless Pete knows, we could give you some information about it. But I, like I said, I am, uh, this is uh, fourth, uh, fourth year, Pete, do you know? Fourth or fifth year we've done this. This is a competition, and, and every year I am just, just amazed with not only the winners who actually get to fly their experiment, but even the students who don't get to fly their experiment. The, the, what, the, what they're exploring, what they're learning, and, and really the encouragement that they give to us who are even just listening to them is, is tremendous. Thank you. Can we get, um, have this person ask a question? Ken? Hi, thank you, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. First, good luck to everybody. Uh, Frank, I want to ask you about the late load items. Can you go into some much more greater detail about what they are, any Meistronauts or biological organisms? And, and Kirk, talk about 20 years. What, what, is, what does it mean to you, where we've come and where we're going? Thanks. Well, I think on the, on the late load part, we do have uh, rodents on this on this mission these are the first time that we've actually second time we've launched rodents but it's the first time they've actually been uh, ready for the mission at the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk so we're excited about that the uh, the team the scientists there uh, prepared them put them in the uh, the transporter and then they were driven up here by part of our team uh, across the Bay Bridge tunnel and made their way to uh, to the horizontal integration facility uh, this morning for final processing, and then they were loaded into the vehicle on the on the pad. Uh, the 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 rodents come with their own transporter, and then separate from that, but related is the environmental system that provides them oxygen and scrubs the air and in the in the in the, uh, in the transporter as they go. So that's that's a, another uh, uh, exciting rodent mission for us. We also have a couple of other uh, polar. Uh, lockers, so they, they are essentially freezers that have uh, experiments within them to preserve them until they get on orbit. And those are part of the pa powered payloads that we, that we fly. So uh, there are different types of ways to keep the payloads cool, but the, the polars are, require power and they also have command and telemetry. So that's just some of the uh, final load that we've, we put in the vehicle. And uh, 20 years, uh, to really to me, uh, tomorrow is 19 years. So tomorrow, 19 years ago uh, was the first time Sergei Krikalov, uh, Yuri Gudzinko, and uh, William Shepard, Bill Shepard, moved into the ISS. And then here we sit 19 years later, and uh, every day of every year, uh, we've had people living and working in space. Uh, in the early years, I used to, one of our, one of our um, co-workers had a, a, a daughter that was married, uh, not married, was uh, born a couple of days after this. and. We have pictures of her every year, and uh, what's amazing is she's in college. And so, uh, you know, what it really means is there's a whole new generation here that's going to take over for us and, uh, and lead us further into space than we've ever been. And that generation doesn't know that people don't fly in space. In fact, they know it's quite possible to live and, uh, and exist and to flourish in space. So to me, it's really the encouragement of the future is what this means. Now ISS still has a lot of life, uh, life in it, and so I'm excited about the years we have left, but I'm, I'm, I'm even more excited about the legacy in our, in our, in our children and our grandchildren, not only here in the U.S., but really around the world. So it's, it's really great for our future. Um, I'm very, very happy to have been part of it and uh, looking forward to the future. 
Thank you. Um, let's get this side of the room. Um, the gentleman in the back, Sorry. Black Shirt. Yeah, Alex Mankey, Mr. of the Zog 43 Rocketry Magazine. This is for Mr. Everly. Um, you're about to launch more total Cygnus payload mass than ever before on an upgraded rocket that you just described. Uh, where does the Antares team get its confidence that you're going to hit your insertion orbit numbers? Is it from the flight history? Is it from conservatism that was built into the, the rocket before? Or maybe there's another way you're getting the confidence for this flight. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. How do you know a rocket's going to work before you launch it? Uh, it's very, that's a, that's a classic question and, uh, you know, I went to school and learned, tried to learn as much as I could about it, but you really only learn it when you, when you do it. Uh, there's a lot of testing that goes on uh, on the ground. So we test everything that we can on the ground. There's very few things we don't test. Uh, we, for example, the first, the main engines, we fire them for 219 seconds, so that's a little bit more than a first stage burn. Uh, we exercise all the power settings that we're going to use and mixture ratio settings that we're going to use during the burn. Um, and, and all the electronics are tested and put through environments. We put them in a thermal chamber. We, uh, we uh, raise the temperature up and down and so on. Uh, uh, so we do as much as we can to gain confidence that, that, you know, that the actual harbor as built is going to work as intended. But then I think part of your question is also how do you have the models to know that you, you know, set the throttle at this throttle setting and you're going to achieve the orbit that you thought you were going to achieve. And there's a whole science to that and we have our guidance nav control engineers that model the air, the atmosphere, how the rocket goes through the air. We have an aerodynamic model. Uh, they, they simulate this over and over again. Then we disperse uh, all sorts of important parameters. This is called a Monte Carlo analysis. So you'll take stage one thrust, disperse it up and down. Stage two thrust, same thing. Aero model, disperse it left and right. Uh, all these things combined, you do random draws and you run these computer simulations over the course of days and you get a statistical uh, prediction of where you're going to end up. And we do that over and over again and then we see how variations in all these uh, parameters uh, on the rocket, how it's built, how it performs, the winds, uh, the density of the atmosphere, all these variations can affect the launch and we, we factor that into this statistical analysis and that gives us the confidence to go to Cygnus and say, hey, we're going to put you here and we have an ICD with them. It's a box, we've got to be in for uh, apogee and perigee and, uh, and inclination. We put them there, they've got the budget, and they do the same kinds of analysis on their end, you know, the, for all these kinds of variation to get themselves to orbit. So that's how we break it down into bite-sized chunks, and, and then we do this, this uh, typical uh, statistical analysis that gives us the confidence to go forward. Uh, so can't say enough about our team. They're, they're really experienced. We, as a company, we launched lots of rockets, and that history gives us that, that model uh, heritage that we really believe in these models. Thank you. We have um, time for about one or two more questions. I see gentleman in the back. Uh, my question is for Kurt. Um, Michael Phillips with weatherboy.com. Uh, in your opening remarks, you mentioned how uh, you were thankful for the local support um, for, for the program here. And, and based on the traffic we saw with NG-11, there's a lot of love in Virginia uh, for your rockets. Uh, Alaska Aerospace had proposed building a spaceport uh, outside of Hilo in Hawaii, and it was announced yesterday um, that uh, one of the reasons was uh, due to strong negative feedback from the community, that project would not move forward. So as other communities around the U.S. look to build spaceports and get it, get it licensed through the FAA, what advice do you have for those organizations and those communities to replicate the love you have here in Virginia? That's a great question. You know, uh, I would say that, you know, Wallops has been here since 1945, I want to I say, Jeff, and uh, so it's been a research range since then, and it's a very rural area, and, and you really need that, that uh, setback distance from your launch pad. So the Wallops Island is a barrier island, and there's really not many communities uh, or people living close to the to those launch pads. I think that's, you know, if you're trying to take an area that's already populated and you're saying I'm gonna put, you know, a launch, I'm gonna put a spaceport here next to where people are living, that's a difficult situation to get past because uh, on a bad day you have to, you know, the, your primary concern is public safety and you have to have those setback distances or it's just not gonna work out. Um, and then I would think, I think really good communication with the, with the local populace, uh, explain what your intentions are, get the, get the local leaders behind you. 
Uh, we've had great support here. Uh, we're a member of the Wallops Island Regional Alliance. Uh, we, we, uh, we meet with folks. We get great support from, uh, from the hotels in the area. Uh, they're happy to see us here. Uh, we, we do get great catering support on launch day from the local uh, businesses, and we get to know them over the months that, that our team is here uh, working, and we, and we hire locally. So we have uh, about 45 permanent staff here at Wallops, and that helps us to, uh, to gain that uh, community support. And our last question. Uh, I heard you speak about, uh, I'm Xander with the NASA Social, I heard you speak about the upgrades to the Antares. My, my question is, uh, you're going to hit Miko a little bit sooner because you're throttling at 100%, and now the nose cone is, how does that affect nose cone separation, where typically we just see two halves, but now you have one piece on the front. Does yeah. it separate with one of the halves? Yeah, what, what faked you out in that video, you saw the nose cone as one single piece, but it's actually two pieces. And it's held together by a, pe by a bracket, a piece of ground support equipment they're gonna remove. So, so actually, when the nose cone gets back reattached to the fairing, it's actually, there's two halves of that nose cone, cone and each separates with each half. So it's the same fairing separation system that we will do, that we've used in the past. It'll just have this uh, attached nose cone half on each half, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining us and tuning in online. Um, as a reminder, the launch is scheduled for tomorrow, November 2nd at 9.59 a.m. Eastern. NASA TV coverage will begin at 9.30. You can also watch it on nasa.gov live. Until then, we, you can check the status of the mission online at www.nasa.gov slash Northrop Grumman and follow Life and Science aboard the space station at www.nasa.gov station. Go Antares, go Cygnus, go Science. <laughs>